Now we get to the last part of the poem from line 17, which is also the most difficult part of the poem, um, because there are some difficult words. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes raising in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as a cart of vile incurable sores and innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce decorum est pro patria mori. Se in qualche incubo soffocante anche tu potessi camminare dietro al vagone sul quale lo abbiamo lanciato e vedere gli occhi bianchi che rotolavano sul suo viso, la faccia penzolante come la faccia di un diavolo che scontava le sue pene, i suoi peccati, se potessi sentire ad ogni movimento del carro il, il sangue che gorgogliava fuori dai suoi polmoni corrotti, quindi distrutti, osceni come il cancro, amari come il fiele, se potessi vedere, sottinteso, quelle piaghe disgustose su quelle lingue innocenti, allora, amico mio, tu non diresti con tale entusiasmo, non racconteresti con così grande entusiasmo e zelo ai tuoi figli, ardenti di qua per qualche gloria disperata, la vecchia bugia, dulce decorum est pro patria mori, dal latino, sweet and glorious to die for your country, è dolce e glorioso morire per la tua patria. So line 17 introduces the last part of the poem. Uh, smothering means, to smother in English means to put a hard, pressure over the face of someone so that a person can't breathe. So these dreams or nightmares, more than dreams, they are nightmares that the protagonist is having, they are smothering in the sense that when he is experiencing this nightmare, he can't even breathe, he is suffocating. So in this stanza, the poet addresses himself to someone else, to the listener or to the reader of the poem. And he says, if you, reader, could walk behind the wagon upon which we threw the body of this soldier, flung, he didn't use the word threw, he used flung, because to flung, fling flung means to throw violently. So he wants to convey the idea of inhumanity of the war, of the condition of the soldiers who are no more human beings, they're treated like animals, they, there, there is no humanity in front of the worm. A man is dying in terrible agony. They pick him up and throw him violently in, onto the wagon. And if you could see his face with these white eyes which are wreathing. Wreathing means that these eyes are moving from side to side very quickly because he's going to lose his awareness. He's going to faint and he's going to die. His face, which is hanging down from the wagon, so he's not properly lying on the wagon, but he has just been thrown over it. And at every movement of the wagon, the blood comes from the mouth, the lungs and the mouth of the man. He uses again this particular word that is gargling. Gargling is an onomatopoeic word because it reproduces reproduces gargling, the noise made when men's lungs are coming out from the mouth. They have been liquefied, they have produced this water, this poisonous water, so they, which runs out of the mouth and makes that noise, gargles. And the lungs are corrupted, they produce water and froth, froth means foam, skewma which is bitter as the cud. The cud is again referred to the semantic field of animals because the cud is the grass which is ruminated, chewed by cows. Therefore, it is very bitter because it contains the acid from the stomach. So it's a beastly, awful, horrible, disgusting image. But the poet just wants to realistically depict what is 
happening, what happened in the war. And the mouth of this man has been devastated by the gas. It has got sores on it, sores on the tongues, which are innocent because these were young soldiers, young men who had volunteered who had joined the war as volunteers and who believed that the war was necessary for their country, who believed to find some kind of glory, some kind of um, ambition. And they sacrificed themselves for these patriotic ideals. Okay, so the poet says, if few reader, readers could see what I have seen and I continue to see my nightmares, then you, my friend, obviously my friend is uh, very ironic and sarcastic. He, the friends he's referring to are the politicians, the fathers, the people who are at home, who sent their young children to the trenches, but who did not participate in the war, who still believed that the war was necessary and was glorious. So you, my friend, you wouldn't tell with such enthusiasm, enthusiasm to your children looking for some kind of glory, you wouldn't tell them the old lie. And the old lie is, it is sweet and glorious to die for your country. So all the propaganda of the war, which was transmitted by posters, by political speeches, uh, and by public opinion, that was just a big lie. So these young soldiers have just been deceived, ingannati. They have just been deceived. They have just been told lies. They, will, they won't find any glory in this war. They ju will just find this. So violence, pain, suffering, cruelty, and eventually death. Owen here is describing how a soldier is, is killed. He's taking the idea of glory and show, and he shows what it really means to take part in a war. So the last stanza is the very message of the poem. He uses violent images of agony and death, harsh sounds, like the repetition of the alliteration of G or R, which are harsh sound to reproduce this uh, heavy picture. The agony of the death produced by chemical warfare, by gas, which was something never used before. He describes how a soldier is killed. He clearly renders the vision of young soldiers dying at war. And the message of the poem at the end is obviously a message with a deep ironic meaning. So we can understand now the ironic meaning of the title. Politicians lie to young innocent men. They appeal to their sense of military glory, to their sense of patriotism, but they are just telling them lies. And these old and these young men can't do anything when they are in the war. So if we make a comparison, Brooke and Owen are completely different. Brooke in The Soldier talks about patriotism and love for your country. He uses a conventional and sometimes also archaic or um, device and form with uh, um, sentimental tone, imagery taken from nature, related with joy, God and a peaceful rural England, which is also personified as the mother of these glorious soldiers. So it gives this idealized vision of the war. On the other side, we've got Owen, who, in his poem, makes a manifesto against war. This poem is a manifesto against war. He shows how patriotism can be manipulated. And he wants the reader he wants us to feel pity of war, to feel the human aspects of the suffering at war. He manipulates language because he introduces uh, 
lots of alliterations, uh, assonances, onomatopoeic words, precise use of language in order to give this acoustic and visual force of the terrible experience of the word. His tone is absolutely anti-heroic. All the words and phrases mirror realistically the physical and psychological suffering of soldiers who died in the war and of those soldiers who survived as himself, as a shell shock case, who is psychologically devastated, psychologically devastated and still having nightmares. This world becomes a kind of nightmarish, hallucinatory world. world. And he also describes the environment in which the trenches and the battle in the trenches was fought. So he condemns at the end uh, war, he uses irony at the same time, and the poet underlines that there is nothing noble, nothing decorous, nothing glorious, war means just death and degradation.